Folks, a brush hog is one of the absolute most popular tools out there, just about a staple of every tractor. You see them all the time, all over the place. Most of you out there probably own them, or if you're getting a tractor and getting set up, you're probably thinking about buying one. Now, a lot of these tips will apply to a flail mower as well, but we're gonna be using a brush hog in today's example. This is gonna be an extreme set of circumstances, all right? We are, number one, we're close to an area where I have got a tractor stuck before and that's not too surprising if you follow the channel but this area is very mucky and I mowed the perimeter of it previously when we were in a real drought uh, spell but we've recently in the last few weeks reversed course we've had a lot of rain and so I really lucked out I, I mowed this area then I, I tilled it up uh, a little bit I, I planted some some screening cover around this perimeter and I'm hoping it takes off it hasn't germinated yet but uh, it should be popping up anytime now if it's going to be successful. And in the middle of this area, I want to clear this out, and I'm going to end up broadcasting some seed into it for a food plot. A little, a little secluded food plot uh, for deer this fall with clover, maybe some brassicas, some buckwheat, a little bit of rye perhaps. We'll see. Um, it's going to depend on how everything goes. It's again, it's a very unique area. I'm not going to be able to till this with as wet as it is, but I need to get all of this weed cover knocked down and killed off. But I want to take you through some tips to successfully use your brush hog um, effectively and safely, all right? There's going to be a lot of different ways, a lot of different variables that can work to your advantage or work against you if you're doing it the wrong way. So let's talk about cut height first of all. And in today's example, again, this is, this is very tall, thick, wet material. And it's not that you can't tackle this material, but it's going to require a different mindset going into it where if you're in a, just an open dry field that you've mowed once or twice already this year, you can probably cut this at a lower height and at a faster speed than you would in this example here. So let your circumstances dictate how you're gonna mow. In this case, I'm probably gonna mow a little bit higher and you can mow even a foot higher or taller if you needed to and make a second pass, kind of get that, that initial cut down and then take the secondary pass to really chop up everything and get it to the height that you want. Now there's two angles, a forward and a rear leaning angle that you can do with your brush hog. If you want to get the most fuel efficient cut, um, take the least amount of horsepower, then what you're gonna typically do is put the front end, okay, that leading end of your brush hog a little bit lower, about an inch lower, give or take, uh, compared to the rear side. That discharge side on the back is gonna be about an inch higher or so. Now the flip side of that is if you want to have the front side a little bit higher, maybe an inch higher and the back an inch lower, what that's gonna do is allow that debris to cut multiple times in there. So you're gonna get a finer chop, probably a little bit more evenly dispersed material flow out of there as well, instead of more of those windrows that you happen to see a lot with brush hogs. One thing you wanna make sure to avoid is not to cut too low. This is not a finished mower, it's not a flail mower. Brush hogs don't excel when cutting too low, all right? You're gonna have too much debris that gets clogged up in there and really bogs down the mower first of all but also you're gonna be prone to scalping, and scalping's bad for a variety of reasons. Number one, if you're hitting the ground uh, frequently, you're gonna be dulling your blades a lot quicker. Two, you're a lot more likely to catch things, like you know rocks or uh, branches, things that are laying on the ground, and maybe other hidden metal debris. We showed, showed you a couple of pictures recently of a guy that was brush hogging and, and flung a, a, a hunk of steel, came flying out and whacked a, a roll bar or a, a brush guard or something on his, on his UTV. And, if you're scalping the ground a lot, you're gonna be more prone to doing that. On top of that, it's not good for the drive line, for the gearbox, for all the components involved when they have those jarring stops when they're whacking the ground. Now, just because you have a five foot or a six foot or a seven foot mower does not mean that you need to use that whole width, all right? Sometimes it's gonna to be too much for your tractor. You know, you try to get an attachment that's gonna handle almost all of the scenarios and circumstances that you're gonna get into but sometimes you're just in an extreme situation and it's gonna be pushing the limits a bit too much for your machine. So if you have a five foot cutter, but it's just super nasty like what we're doing today, maybe you go slower, maybe you only take three foot, maybe you take four foot, okay? You don't take a full width just to make it easier on yourself, easier on the machine. It's gonna wind up being more efficient and less frustration too. If you can stick with dry material, you know, the taller it is, especially if it's in the morning or after a rain, you're gonna have damp material down in there. You know, it's hard for the sun to get down and dry things out. If it's been a real dry spell, that can also be, it, this came up recently, um, I think it was somebody out in, uh, oh, the desert somewhere, New Mexico, Arizona, who 
was very aware of fire dangers and just it takes one spark to start a forest fire out there and so that's kind of the flip side right if it's too dry well then you got to be aware of that kind of thing too and it's a good reason to try to carry a fire extinguisher whenever you can as well you need to be aware of the risks either way is is i guess the point that i'm trying to say and if you have mitigation plans in place then you're going to be set up for success you can't eliminate every risk but you certainly can prepare for them so owner's manuals really do have a lot of good information and some are better than others and i would encourage you at least from a rotary cutter standpoint, check out Rhino Ag's manuals. They're available on their website. They're completely free. They're incredibly thorough. You know, you can tell that a lawyer's been through this uh, a few times and told them to uh, <laughs> to repeat certain things and, and whatnot, but it's gonna give you an absolute ton of information on setting up a brush hog, on uh, how to maintain them in general, on all the safety things that you need to do for um, the, the cutter itself, for the, the tractor, for the operator, for people that are around you and everything else. It's just a very thorough manual and again a completely free resource for you to bounce it off of and that's going to apply to shoot not even not just rhino ag cutters but any rotary cutter and a lot of it's going to be applicable to other tractor attachments as well. A few other things worth considering you're going to hear it both ways take your bucket off or leave it on. So that is gonna be definitely application specific. Uh, it's good to have your bucket on there because you do need some counterweight. Typically around 20% of your total tractor weight should be up front. Um, you need to maintain steering, right? You wanna avoid the bounce of having not enough weight up front, but then also you're gonna steer with your front tires. So if you don't have enough weight up there to hold those tires on the ground, you're not gonna be turning very well. Another benefit of having your bucket is if you are in a situation like we're in today where there's a risk of getting stuck. Using your bucket to get you unstuck can be done, and if you don't have it on there, well, that's just gonna make things worse. The flip side, okay, removing your bucket is gonna make it easier to maneuver, and that's gonna be not required for a lot of folks, and we don't really need to worry about space restrictions uh, in the area that we're mowing today, but if you are in a tight area, in tight quarters, you know, that's an extra, oh, I don't know, 18 inches, two foot that you can knock off of the total length of your tractor and make it that much easier to turn in tight spaces. Now something that has stuck with me from a few years ago, whenever it was in a brush hugging video I did, uh, somebody had mentioned if it's, uh, if I'm not getting enough air into my engine compartment because that bucket is blocking and just restricting the airflow and you know, this thing's going two miles an hour or something, right? So there, there's not a whole lot of uh, draft that's going on or anything like that. So that's not really a concern that you need to be worried about. Although, it is gonna provide some additional protection, right? Especially if you're in a really shrubby area with a lot of uh, thicker material, perhaps it knocks it down a bit more and gets it underneath, uh, protects your grill guard and the front end a little bit more too from um, taking all that stuff head on and potentially causing damage or putting holes in your grill. But speaking of grills, radiator screens, all that kind of thing, man, it depends on the season that you're mowing in, but those things can clog up so bad you gotta pay attention to the temperature gauge on your tractor. You'll see that needle start to climb, and if it gets into the red, that's no bueno, all right? So pay attention to that, and you're gonna see stuff flying all around all the time, and in certain seasons when things are pollinating and whatnot are gonna be worse than other times of the year too, but plan on a little bit of extra time to hop off that tractor, leave it running at idle. That's gonna help the system cool down uh, and get the engine temperature down, put the safeties on and everything else, and then use common sense, go around and, and, and knock off all that built up degree that's trying to get sucked in and clog things up. That is what is restricting airflow and could potentially damage your tractor's engine if gone unchecked. Most tractors these days will tell you to engage the PTO when you're at idle and then slowly rev it up from there. So typically that's gonna be what you wanna do. Reference your owner's manual if it tells you anything different. You're gonna be in low range when you're mowing. You know, you'll hear folks say they can go flying along with their brush hogs, but that's just a recipe for disaster. Stay in low range, go slow, be under control. Know that you can come to a stop immediately if you need to, especially on new lands, new areas, or, or tall grass areas. You know, folks have commented, and, and gratefully so, land that they've owned for 20, 30 years, their whole life, whatever it is, there's still areas where there's washouts that might pop up from time to time after a storm. There could be sinkholes, terrain changes, nothing stays the same, so circumstances are gonna change all the time and if you're going too fast that's when you you hit that sinkhole or that's when you know a washout happened and you go 
teeter-tottering down in it and tip over. We mowed a new property that I had a couple of years ago and ran over a pickaxe that was just buried in the weeds out there. Fortunately, um, it didn't go flying anywhere, but we just ran right over it. But there's, there's all sorts of stuff that can just be hiding down in there that you, maybe you had something on your tractor that you hauled along with you or on a UTV, you never could find it, you don't know what happened to it, and it's just lying out there in the field somewhere. Then the next time you're out there mowing, you pick it up and it goes flying somewhere. Typically, you do wanna have your roll bar up and your seat belt on. Again, that's for those hopefully unlikely scenarios, but that's why we all wear the seat belts and that's why they have them on here to begin with. Have your roll bar up, your seat belt on, so if you do hit a pothole, if you do maybe climb up, maybe it doesn't even be a, a pothole, there could be a, a stump or um, a log, some, or maybe a cinder block that's just hiding in the grass and you just don't know about it, enough to get you cattywampus and maybe one side goes up a foot, two foot in the air and rolls things over and it just happens in the blink of an eye. So there's areas like the four foot areas that we're mowing today, parts of it I've never mowed before. I'm gonna go slow expecting, right, there to be something there. Probably won't be, but there's always a chance. We're proud to be sponsored by RimGuard Solutions, a liquid ballast weight. It goes right inside your tires, completely hidden. We're big on safety on this channel. These tractors are just too light and tippy right out of the factory. Not only is it gonna help with safety, keeping those rear tires planted on the ground, it helps with loader efficiency and traction too. The benefits of RimGuard include being the heaviest all natural liquid ballast weight on the market. It's not gonna corrode your rims like the old calcium chloride. It's not gonna freeze and it's available at over a thousand dealers nationwide. Find the dealer near you at RimGuardSolutions.com. Dealing with hills is very dangerous. You know, this could be uh, just a, a hillside in your field. This could be a hill going down to your pond. It could be a ditch bank along a road. We've mowed all these scenarios and when you can, Avoid side hilling, driving sideways along the hill. Always drive up and down, all right? Maintain four wheel drive. That's gonna give you uh, braking power to the front axle as well. And I prefer to back down hills, all right? So start at the top and back down. You can drive down them and that's gonna be, I'll leave that up to you guys on what you wanna do, but the safest operation is to back down those hills and it makes sense backing down <laughs> along a, uh, a pond, for example, but it's gonna allow you to quickly climb back up and out if you need to. And the last thing I would probably say is really get yourself a cab tractor. <laughs> if you're out there brush hogging in the, in the heat all summer long, man, if you have allergies, if you run into uh, the hornets or wasp or anything else, if you just get sick of the heat, if you want to keep the sun off of your skin, anything else, a cab is just so hard to beat. But if you can't afford a cab, because that is a really nice luxury and not a necessity, well, maybe look at a canopy. We still have to add one on to this 2038R. We actually just got one in uh, recently. We got to throw on here, but the Rhino Hide canopy is is nearly indestructible. All right, it's super lightweight. You can take it on and off for trailing or for storage. It's easy to put on. It's going to keep the sun off of you, make it more enjoyable to be out there on your tractor because it is tough when that sun is beating down on you on those hot summer days. Okay, so out here is a little tiny secluded food plot area and. Again, very mucky. Um, I really gave it high throttle to get through the area that we had previously mowed and tilled up because that is, one of my other tractors almost got stuck down in there and the Kubota got stuck about uh, 20 yards away from us. So that's the difference though between having all of the, the grass that's growing here versus nothing, right? The, all that grass that's growing really allows that ground to firm up a lot. Um, and soak up a lot of that water. Not that it's not still spongy and you have to be careful, but it just makes a dramatic difference. I had a few comments when we mowed this area previously about how I'm mowing down all the goldenrod and all this other uh, great pollination habitat and everything else, and that is true. Uh, we're, we're mowing down a small portion of that now, but you can see we're surrounded by it as well, all right? This is just a small pocket in the middle of our 40 acres. And in fact, we're gonna end up planting Oh, I think it's about another four acres or so of pollinator habitat, maybe a little bit more than that even, um, later this fall and next spring as well. So we're gonna more than make up for that. We're just kind of restructuring and relaying out the property a little bit uh, for our needs too. I decided early on that I'm gonna try to just take one pass today uh, as low as I can go. I just want to see what would happen with it. And overall, it did well. It did leave some stems uh, in some of the areas there, uh, but overall, it, it's gonna tackle the vast majority of it. I may come back and, and mow it down again, um, but this is gonna be more of a no-till situation. You know, ideally you would, you would spray, right? And that's a thing that a lot of guys don't wanna deal with and, and talk about these days, but you gotta be able to have conditions for the seed that you want to germinate and not be crowded out by all the competition. So that's a story for another time. But hopefully it picks up on video how 
these tires are almost tracking or trenching and compressing down in this spongy ground. It was uh, a sharp turn or two away from really sinking down in there, but able to manage it. A five foot cutter on a 2038R is a great matchup. This is a lot of horsepower for the frame size. Um, you know, you get to like a 2025R running this big old heavy Rhino five foot cutter and that could wind up being a little bit too extreme. Um, you might be better served with the Dirt Dog cutter, which we sell a lot more of those cutters. The Dirt Dog cutters are great. Um, not as beefy and robust, but they're also like less than half the cost. And we sell a boatload of those. They're made in America as well. So check those out on our website. This is part of our overall whitetail management plan that we had uh, Jeff Sturgis from, an, he's another YouTuber, but also runs a business uh, much more successfully than that even, I would say. He's been doing this for 20, 30 plus years, whatever it is, going around the country to folks' properties that um, are whitetail enthusiasts or wildlife enthusiasts and trying to lay out their property to attract wildlife, right? Not just deer, but turkeys and pheasants and uh, quail and, and all sorts of critters. And, and that's just an overall good plan for the environment. And it does require, like what we're doing here, some restructuring, right? And I'm excited. This is we're a, what are we a month in? I think to, to starting to implement his plan, and it's a, it's a journey, right? It's not going to happen overnight, but uh, I think within two or three years, we'll really start to see the improvements, and it's a lot of fun to do. You know, if you have the equipment already, or maybe you're you're looking for a piece of land and uh, you want to get the equipment too, it's just a, a fun way to utilize that and get outdoors and and uh, transform your property and have a good time with the family. So, folks, I hope you enjoyed today's video. This was you know, kind of some extreme circumstances, some really thick, tall brush out here that we cut down, some tips to how to successfully brush hog, right? And you're gonna hear different things from different folks all the time. I mean, always go back to the manual, that's a great baseline, and then you kind of make the tweaks based on what works for you, your situation, your equipment. There's no one size fits all, all right? So just take a conglomerate, you know, of all that info, dissect it, chop it up, and make it work for you. But if you're looking for a brush hog, a flail mower, Anything else for your three-point hitch or your front end loader, we'd love to help you out. Go to goodworkstractors.com. We sell and ship all over the country every day of the week. And just like this video, we've got over 700 other videos out there too. So if you enjoy tractor stuff, make sure to check those out. I want to thank you for taking time out of your day to stop by. And until next time, stay safe. We'll see you soon. Bye.